So welcome to an evening with our October session. I'd like to introduce Jakob Satula. Um, thank you very much for joining us. For anybody who doesn't know, Jakob is a business partner with L Cup Creative, and you will have seen them at all of the Guild shows. And in fact, this year they've been celebrating 10 years of business and kindly donated um vouchers worth a hundred pounds at each of our shows which people could actually their advanced ticket numbers were put into the hat um so that was very generous and means that a lot of people have acquired l cut kits um and are very keen to know about the building of them and painting of them as a, a business partner, Jakob is mainly involved in business development now and actually looking at design and product development, customer service and IT. So an absolute um, ideal person to talk to us this evening. And often you'll see Jakob um, de demonstrating at our shows as well. So Jakob, thank you very, very much for joining us and I'll hand over to you. Well, thank you ever so much for having me today. Uh, hopefully it's going to be an interesting evening for all of you. Uh, right, so on today's evening with, we've got, it's more of a slightly scratch build item than a kit, but it's made up out of uh, kit parts essentially, uh, with just one uh, part that I've made specially for it, but it's it's something that I will, I will put in, in, in our range. Uh, all it is is just a very simple brick shelter, nothing too complicated, and we'll go over most of the stages of uh, how I've built that. Even though there's uh, a little bit of uh, parts that need to be trimmed to size, it's again, it's not something that's particularly difficult. Um, right, let's crack on. I've got my props here, so just give me a second. So the kit starts as parts essentially these are we, we we these are sold on our website uh you can pick and choose however many of them you want uh, and most of these are from actually uh, our seven mil narrow gauge range because they are a little bit lower but we'll be cutting them down even lower a little bit uh what i noticed that some some buildings like this shelter they want to be a little just a tiny bit lower uh, it just looks more in proportion. Right, so from parts like that, just using a hobby knife, stand, well, not standing knife, but just your standard hobby knife, it really doesn't matter as long as it's 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 sharp and uh, comfortable to use. Uh, steel ruler, that's all you need. Just place that. I've, and in this case, we in, in the case of this part, we don't need to worry uh, about marking it because we're just cutting down a few of the uh, of the courses. So just chop that off. And we go to uh, essentially that's that's all it is. So we've got a few of those ready. Then for the sides, the windows they needed to move down a little bit so we chopped off a tiny bit from the bottom and we chopped off a tiny bit from the top again same sort of uh, thing not really too complicated uh, right next just a moment the on this wall we need to chop off parts because again these are standard parts but we need to chop off parts of it so it's a smooth uh, surface essentially this is slightly more difficult to cut because you have to be a little bit more careful uh, again you just use the bricks to line it up and in this case you want quite a few very gentle light cuts so that it doesn't disturb the bricks too much uh, once you've done it a couple of times, it's it's really not too, too bad. You get used to it. Um, so once we've got that, we get to the stage of actually assembling the elevations. So we've got the two side elevations, two of these. 
She again chopped off and the the uh, the uh, window moved. All of these, make sure the 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 the, the uh, tops match and bottoms match, just slotted in together. Obviously, we've not applied the glue. I'll talk about the glue in a second. So what I do in, in old gauge especially, because we do more than old gauge, in smaller scales, I recommend, especially in 2 mil and TT120, I recommend, let's see, it's, it's uh, the Deluxe Materials Laser Cut uh, Kit Glue. This is really, really good for any of the finer stuff. Windows, I mean, even in old gauge, you can use it for windows for any, any sort of, any of the smaller, finer stuff. Uh, when you get to double O gauge and O gauge, I tend to prefer uh, wood glue or PVA. We do occasionally stock our own PVA glue. Um, I mean, this is this is really wood glue, but PVA same, even cheap PVA from from a hard from from Poundland or something like that. It's perfectly fine because the material it's so the material that we use it's wood fiberboard rather than MDF, and it's significantly easier to glue than mdf mdf tends to you you'll stick it together but it's it, the, the glue needs to seep the way wood glue is it needs to seep into the material a little bit and mdf doesn't always happen you need to dilute it a little bit so it's a little bit more tricky to glue mdf than this so we've got that let me take it apart again and what i do is what i personally do is i just have a scrap piece of paper bit of glue on that uh, I have a brush somewhere and just a knack it all brush I think this one is number three it can be smaller can be bigger for whatever you're doing for flat pieces if I was doing this I would um, see if I can show it very bit, bit better I would come from behind and apply glue in between the bricks so that it don't mark the front scribed uh, part of it and then i would join them once once that's done i would join them together and what i also do is nowadays is i have some uh, uh wet wipes just normal cheaper wet wipes and gently one one or two wipes on the back if there's any you know, if there's anything, uh, if, if anything came through on the front, again, just give it a very quick wipe and you're just keeping things clean and also clean your hands with those wet wipes um, a lot. Because when you're working with laser cut stuff, you've got uh, the residue the uh, on, on the side, you've got a bit of residue, which then gets everywhere. It tends to, over time, create like a very sticky mud almost when it uh, mixes uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, with glue. We've got that we've got the elevations as i said and on the on corners uh almost the same technique but more coming at a bit more of an angle and attend, and on on the corners i tend to just wipe off the corner that's going to be exposed join those together make sure they are all nice and tight so with laser cut kits there is a, a, a quite i get questions regarding corners and one sort of small disadvantage with laser cut kits is that the corners are more prominent uh, unless you know how to deal with them because they're quite a bit darker they require more thicker paint essentially more, more layers you can mitigate it with uh, with with uh, priming we'll get to we'll get to that later anyway but the other thing is you want to make sure that it's all seated very well. Don't push it too hard because obviously the material will, will, will uh, you will damage the material, but make sure it's all pushed nice and together. You can clamp it if you want. I tend not to do that with wood glue. It takes so quick, it, 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 it take, it's so quick to grab it that you don't really need to do that. Uh, but I know there's, uh, I don't remember the company, but I know there's one that makes uh, dedicated clamps for laser cut kits, and they're great, but I've never particularly uh, needed them. So we've got our elevations, they're all put together, and we jump forward to that. We jumped some steps, but we'll get to that. Uh, ignore the floor for a second, ignore the uh, the foot and the, and the, uh, uh, the soffit. 
So we just have our building part assembled like that. Now, the, 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 the brick foot, all it is, again, it's going back to our modular parts, is these, this is a part from our bridge kit. It's just like a decorative, you know, strip of bricks. All you do is, uh, I don't know if I can demonstrate it very well, but to get it to interlink on the corner, you just simply cut out a little bit of it out. Uh, in fact, there is uh, on our website there is a the, the, it is a very old manual which actually covers that, so we can link to that later on. But it's it's a bit daunting. But once you've done it once or twice, it's not too bad. And again, all you're doing is just cut out a sharp hobby knife. You cut out a little bit, and you lay it left with uh, courses uh, the bricks sticking out, so you can then overlay it like I don't know if it, if it, if it shows on the camera very well unfortunately focuses so there'll be pictures of all of all of that after the show so you can go back and uh, review it but it's the same base so so these do these don't have interlocking bricks on the ends and all i did was i just created them myself with a, with a hobby knife i so said again it's not, not 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 particularly difficult to do once you've done the once once or twice so we go around it, we've got our foot defined. The only thing that this is missing um, is uh, there should be some bricks that go about a 45 degree angle. Uh, this is something that I don't have in the range, something that I need to do uh, or fairly soon actually, because it's been pointed out to me that it's very much needed. Now we've got the foot, now the soffit. All it is, this, these are, it, it's a fret with uh, purlins from double O gauge, the perfect thickness, perfect height. And we don't have to worry about doing any, uh, any uh, corner bricks for that. We just cut a few of them out, just glue one in, chop it off, put another one and chop it off. And that's, that's all there is to it. Uh, the one thing I've missed, uh, be uh, underneath the soffit there's just again those same purlins i've just doubled them up to create a thicker bar to go underneath that i don't know it's not 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 very well visible but it's just a reinforcement bar underneath there so that's the stage we are on very simple now the ceiling very again a part from this is a belief from uh one of our good sheds just a sheet a larger sheet of uh planking cut it out to size glue it in and there's your ceiling with appropriate planking which actually looks on the painted model once it's all painted, it looks qu quite nice and as they would do it in real life. Now, the easy part is over. Now we're going to the roof. Uh, again, we, we do actually have quite a few different uh, parts in our, in our range uh, for roofs. Uh, right, how do I do it? Gods. So these are of, of oversized roof supports from Double O Gauge. It's just the, the, it fits best. Uh, what I do is I just chop a little bit at a time off of it, chop a little bit off, so that it ends up the same width as the building. And I just put a little P to indicate that's the the pattern and I'll work. That's that's my pattern now and now I'll create everything uh, going further from that. All right, see that a little bit. Yeah. And then we've got next next one. Offer them to each other uh, with a sharp pen, with a with a pencil. Just scribe a line, and I've got I can copy them very easily. So that's those. 
Uh, with the roof that's on this building, we need one extra support which goes perpendicular to the main support. Again, this is just a standard part from uh, our range, which uh, in this case I cut them uh, a little bit slightly higher, a little bit taller than the uh, than the main support, and they just fit like that. Let's see if I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there we go. That's the main support for the bridge. Uh, not the bridge, sorry, the uh, the roof. Uh, right, going next. Right, so we've got the supports. We we create, we make two of those for the uh, each of the sides. We just put this away. Now, normally, most of our kits include uh, just a simple engraved roof. Uh, we do sell uh, like an upgrade, which is roof tiles. Just a second. Uh, this is the only this is the only part I specially made for today. Uh, all of this is the uh, old gauge roof tile sheets we do, but uh, scale to seventy five percent. Smaller buildings you need slightly smaller sheets. I we we I need to update that range because I've actually worked out all the uh, different uh, roof tile sizes because uh, there's quite a few there's Duchess Princess I think. But I've got that worked out somewhere. I'll get to it. And I also have uh, very nice diamond roof tiles which I'll be adding to the range. That's going to be quite good. Now, again, because we're going to be using uh, the roof tile strips, uh, we need to make the base uh, of the roof first, so we can glue them on top of, on top of that. We because we're using these parts, we can then use the flat some of, some of the flat engraved roof tile uh, parts from our range as patterns for the angle. Because that's I find that if with with high proofs that the, I find the angle to be the most challenging part working it out. But I'm cheating by using our parts. So very simply, this is just an offcut from what we do. This is material you can find in hobby craft. It's acrylics paper, uh, not particularly thick, but it's it's great. It's got slight texture, so it's uh, when you. We're not going to be painted here, but it's got slight texture. So if you're using it for any kind of woodwork, it gives it a little bit of texture. But super cheap hobby craft. I think may I think the range now actually now stocks them as well. But what we do is we mark the length of the building. So we got that, and then we transfer angles from that. So we just transfer the angle onto two sides and we can cut some of them out and they look like that once you cut them out. Now for the ends, uh, very similar, we use a part that's dedicated for the end so it's not particularly very well visible, the light's a bit bright. But again, it's it's the same same angle, just shorter, making sure that it's about the same length as the end of the building. Just it's going to be at an angle, but it still needs to be same same well width as the building width. So we've got that. Now, uh, right, the roof tiles, uh, roof tiles. Very simple. It's a I actually really like working with them because very therapeutic. Uh, Seems like a daunting job, but just put a movie on, put some music on, cut the each cut, cut some strips out, glue them on, uh, alternating the uh, the the tiles, and just create four of we'll cover base cover all four of the sides. Now moving swiftly forward, I've done a little bit like a cutout part build roof right let me just try it because this light's a bit bright see how that works that's a little bit better i don't know if you can it's still a little bit on the bright side um so remember the remember these these supports there's two of them underneath the purlins from double o gauge just setting the uh the width of it 
not super necessary in this case, but uh, you can use them. And try to show the. So you can see the roof tile strips. Now, you can get away with quite a lot of inaccuracy with uh, hyped roofs because you'll be covering all of the uh, sort of inner edges with ridge tiles. Which we try to find a good angle. So what I do is. Uh, these are again just our standard double gauge uh which tiles uh i had a piece which i but all you do is with with hype tree is uh hold on a second you take one of them and you just sharpen almost sharpen it at one end take your hobby knife score it along the middle line and then you can fold a little bit easier Glue it on. I find that you want a quite you want to put quite a lot of glue on these, uh, because you're gluing to a surface to, to, to sort of an intermittent, almost an intermittent glue joint. We put quite a lot of glue on, and you make sure that it's all nicely evenly together. Uh, you don't have to worry too much. It will look terrible initially when you start assembling it but the ridge tiles are sort of the finishing touch that finishes it and sort of binds it together and uh, covers any mistakes that you did it covers them pretty much so at the end so the ends of the tiles again you just once they're glued on I just take a hobby knife and just chop them off making sure that the line uh, of the ridge tile ends up at the corner because otherwise it just looks goofy uh, in this case I've used a finial from a signal box kit just glued it in with uh, a little bit of uh, contact adhesive which is just this stuff I just get it from home bar I think home barn as I get it from but it's literally everywhere the uh, typically in the yellow uh, tubes it's sold it's this horrible stringy stuff where it sticks everything together that's the most of the assembly uh, covered actually so the adhesives just to recap adhesives uh, wood glue PVA anything from the deluxe materials is excellent uh, for smaller scales, smaller parts, I would recommend that. If you're gluing anything plastic to this material, uh, you can use super glue, and I do use super glue. However, this is, in my opinion, a better choice, simply because it's. Uh, I, I'll just I'll come back to you in a second, Kelvin. Just a second. Yeah, I, I prefer this because it's just it, it's not less permanent, but it's. Uh, Dry, it, it flashes off long. We've got more time. Right. Uh, how do you make half round which tiles for? Uh, right. That's going to be, that will have to be 3D printed. And I am going to get to that. Uh, I have another uh, building that I'm going to be showing in a second. And so I'm working on some more rich, more rich tiles. And yes, I, I, I will be doing that, but they will have to be 3D printed, unfortunately. Well, not, not unfortunately, but they'll just have to be 3D printed. I uh, hope that answers the question. I don't think anybody else makes them, so we're possibly going to be first to make them. So uh, keep an eye on that. Right. So the construction of that is of that little shelter. That's basically it. All oh, right. We've got two more bits, windows. I've had a few questions regarding those uh, as well, because in old gauge, we do them in two parts. And I know I don't include the manual with them, but uh, all you do is just cut them out, uh, right, how is yeah, and stick the one with the engraved lines on top of that, and you just end up with a window. You can make these slightly open, so you just glue them together, slightly open. That's super well visible, and just cut off the remaining top. And I've uh, I've done them that, like that as well. And that looks really good. And the last bit, the little bit of uh, of uh, uh, valence that's uh, in there. 
again double O gauge just because the sizing works a little bit better uh, I think it's some sort of southern railway um, valence but it doesn't really matter in this case cut it out uh, there is a laugh I think it's called a laugh that's in the kit it's that little bit strip there which goes over the top top of it and I've used again the purlin part of the purlin from before just to reinforce it and it goes in like that and that's all there is to it right so that's the little shelter that's the things you can do with our stuff uh, but there's actually more you can do with our stuff something that I've managed to do over the past few weeks something that's uh, a bit more complicated than that uh, little station this is 99% uh, parts that you can buy off the shelf the roof tiles off the shelf the only thing that's new are the rich tiles which are going to be entering the, the uh, our range fairly soon I'll do a few designs on that these are those are laser cut. I can do those laser cut because it's just a simple, fairly flat design. And I've done some new brackets, and I'll be putting those in the range as well. Now, going on to painting. Well, that, uh, yeah, this this is all done from from our part. Uh, this is just uh, I think it's a. Uh, Part from uh, Good Shed, with uh, as part from uh, a bridge, we just I just chopped it up to that shape. Uh, there's some inner supports in there, but this is all sort of done from our uh, our part part in our range. Right? Uh, is there any more questions before we go on to painting? Is there anything anybody would like to ask? I just ask one. Um, of course. Um, you've mentioned that you've used a bit of this double O kit and a bit of yes. that kit and a bit of that kit. Can you go onto the website and order different components? Yes. And so you can literally do almost a pick and mix. Oh yes, yes. Uh, most of, so most of our most most of the customers we have are usually just buy the kits or buy a few extra part kit and few extra parts. I've got few customers that uh, build absolutely incredible buildings with our part system. I've had a chap who built a six foot long shed and it's not, he didn't use shed parts. He just used round, completely random parts and built uh, a, 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 a six foot long shed about four feet wide, just completely from random parts. And not just the outside of it, all the inner, 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 inner structure of it. And it's absolutely incredible what you can do. I need to update our gallery. There is uh, quite a few, there's few, few old pictures in there, but I've had a few new, newer pictures come in since then. And you can see just what incredible models that people made from our parts. Right, we have a uh, question from Calvin again. Uh, right, yes and no. Some. Like, for example, in the case of the ceiling for that, that would have been better painted before I, I glued it in. Uh, I managed to do a half-decent job painting it in situ. But it will be better done uh, separate. Window, uh, windows and doors, I pretty much always do them separate. Uh, just so you can get nicer uh, lines on that. You can, I mean, you can, you can do them in situ, and I've done that in situ, but it's better to do them separate. So what I nowadays do is I, in the manuals, uh, it's mostly going to be in appearing, in, not make, not 100% relevant here, but in the 2 million TT120 ranges that I'm working on, I'm going to be more focusing on, in the manuals, on showing how, sub, how, to, how to assemble it in sub-assemblies, when to paint, um, do it a little bit more 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 like that whereas in nowadays most of the older kits it's just a uh, simple sort of parts diagram and a few words on how to how to assemble it but i'm going to be putting more focus on on that All right is there anything else that anybody wants to ask
thing coming up at the moment. Okay, okay then. Right, so we can always come back to it. So if there's something you want to ask later, don't worry about it. We'll come back to it. Painting. I do get a lot of questions about that. Uh, we've a while ago. I've done some very simple painting guides, which we are give, which we give away with uh, all purchases and shows. They are on the website as well. I've done, I've done some videos. The main thing with laser cut kits, and that uh, that is with both uh, MDF kits, so not our, not not the stuff that we make, but uh, both with our stuff and the MDF. You do need to be careful not to get it too wet because it will essentially turn to, turn to mush. MDF is slightly more resilient to turning into mush, but you can do it very easily. I've done some uh, MDF kits where I wanted to do some washes, uh, mortar washes, things like that, and they just turned into complete mush and it destroyed the kit, unfortunately. Well, ways to mitigate that, uh, be much more careful with how much moisture you put on it and prime. So... What I what I normally say is, it's not always necessary to prime. Uh, whether you prime or not, it will affect few things. Uh, unprimed kits, you'll have more trouble with the corners because they're darker. You're fighting with a darker uh, base color, and you have to put essentially a thicker layer of 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 your of your base color to to hide the dark bit. Essentially, that can be mostly mitigated with uh, priming. You don't need anything fancy. Uh, primer can be in the case of uh, the wood fiber board, the, the 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 material that's almost white in our case. It will take paint without priming. It's paints almost it's 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 card essentially, but it's museum grade card, so it's a little bit better than just off the shelf grey board and things like that. But it sort of behaves in a similar way, so it paints in a similar way. So you can actually paint straight on. The windows and doors, and in fact, are made from watercolor paper. That's very resistant because watercolor is obviously a lot of moisture in there. That's very resistant to moisture, but again, you need to be a little bit careful with that. Regarding priming, I've got a few examples of what I use. Just a moment. Just for completeness, I did test quite a few different. Oops, one second. I've tested quite a few different brands of primers. This is just a half its primer. That works fine. Lately, I've been using the Rust-Oleum one. That's perfectly fine. Uh, if I have a darker building, this Turner and Gray, that works very well. And if I'm feeling extremely lazy, I use this. Because this is your base coat, base color coat. Give, give the building one reasonable coat of that. And that's your base coat done. You don't have to then either use an airbrush or a brush to brush it on. And it's a reasonable color for that. Um, I've done buildings where I literally just used that and then used the mortar wash and that was it. And they look quite good. Right. Uh, paints, the paints that I use. With these two buildings, I went back to using enamel paints. This is something I started with many, many, many years ago, and I still have paints which are knocking on 10 years. Uh, nowadays, I tend to use more acrylics just for the convenience and to be re reasonable and not to poison myself too much. Uh, you really need a good extraction, which I don't have to use enamels, especially when you're spraying them, and it's just not very good for you. But I still use them this time because it was just a bit nostalgic. And I, I, in all honesty, I prefer working with them. I think you do get better finish, but it's that, you know. Right, just a second. We've got a question from Ian. Uh, do I prefer high coat primer over other other brands? No, it doesn't matter. All of them are fine. Uh, if anything, I prefer the half its primer because it seems to give you a thinner coat. Uh, you can do a dust coat. I've had issues with, uh, I don't remember whether it was the Rust-Oleum or the darker one, uh, where I was not as careful as I should have been and I overdid it slightly. It didn't affect it too much because the, with this material, not so much with MDF, the first layer of, of paint will sort of seep into the material. The pigment will stay on top of, on top of the surface, 
but all the uh, solvents and the base tends to run sort of seep into it so even if you use a little bit too much it tends to be all right in the end uh the half it's one it, it really doesn't matter whichever whatever you're comfortable the you can use the i think well, precision do paints do a primer. Uh, Railmart does a primer. You can absolutely use those. It really doesn't matter. The other primers I've been using bef uh, nowadays is uh, primers from Vallejo. Uh, I just I've I've got a small pot of black. I've got it somewhere else, something down there. But it's very similar to that. I think they were mentioned uh, last time as well. Um, I tend to have a big pot of white and a small pot of black, and I just mix uh, to make it great. Right, we've got a question from Kelvin. Uh, paint both sides to prevent warping. Uh, yes, you can do, but you don't have to worry too much about that. These, so we'll be getting onto these in a bit, but these are just painted on one side, and they, what happened was, while the paint was drying, they warped a little bit, but then after that, they straightened back out. But yes, while you're painting, it's not a bad idea to give us to give the other side another a coat as well, just so it doesn't move too much while you're working with. But it's ninety nine percent of the time it just goes back to being flat, and if it doesn't, with our material and even MDF, you can just gently bend it back to shape, very very gently. But you can do that as well. Uh, right, go ahead. yes, we've got another question. Some of our guides mentioned using yacht varnish to seal. Right, we are going to be getting to that in a minute. Can you too much can too much glue cause warping? If you dilute it too much, yes. Sometime in some cases, I recommend uh, if you're using any of these sort of thicker glues, it's not a bad idea to give it a little, just a dab of water just to uh, make it uh, a bit more runny. If you use too much of it, yes, it will because it's just water, so it will absolutely do that uh paints yep so mainly what i use or for, for what i what i use for these uh buildings is uh, phoenix precision paint uh i am still in the process of color matching some of the important colors especially the great western uh, i mean in this case i didn't have to worry about that because i just used uh, whatever precision um uh, makes for these two colors and that worked fine but i am in, in the process of uh, color matching some vallejo paints acrylic vallejo paints to some of the precision paints uh, and i will be posting about that maybe even for the update after the show uh, i may include that in there but i need to order some paint i've done in, i've done the first initial color match but not i've not tested them yet uh, so we've got that. Um, I've used the ter for this one because I wanted it a light, lighter brick. I've used the terracotta base, and what I then do is I took the light red, uh, and I've about fifty fifty in a uh, in one of those, just in one of those, dilute, diluted a just a just a touch with uh, just some enamel finish. And with a thin brush, um, you find a thin brush. What I do is, you can reasonably well see it. See it. I do cl clusters of three, four, five, six, or more bricks, just with a brush. Uh, you don't have to be too too exact because uh, once you do a mortar wash, it will sort of blend in. But what I do is, I do the primary color, which in this case was a terracotta. Then I do a about fifty to seventy-five percent of the bricks in a slightly off color. So in this case, with a uh, the terracotta mixed with a little bit of uh, slightly darker uh, brick red, and then I do a tertiary color, which is probably about ten to twenty-five percent of uh, skewing it slightly other way, so it could be slightly lighter or even darker. What I also do is I take um one of these paints again add a little bit of brown and i do streaks uh almost dry brush streaks and what it does is it's uh 
add gives the gives bricks a little bit of a like a dry brush extra sort of texture so that's how i do and that's a good example as well you can see the clustering it's just the base color with then about 50 to 75 percent of the uh secondary color and then a bit of tertiary color you can go as as you can go as far as you want you can do 10 different colors and some buildings probably would actually benefit from that now once the base color brick color is done we now go to the polyurethane varnish the, it, it doesn't specifically have to be polyurethane varnish the the purpose of this varnish coat is to seal the base color so that if something happens it's easier to sort of wipe off excess uh, paint and it just protects it as well and what it also does is it makes it easy to wipe off your mortar wash or if you're using uh, wall filler which we're actually going to be having a look at in a second as well it makes it easier to wipe that off as well so these two little testers I did, one is just very, very simple, one color acrylic uh, paint and then a spray of the gloss varnish. You can see it's gloss, ends up being gloss. This one's a little bit more of a, uh, more, of, more of a complicated design uh, with the secondary tertiary color and some of the engineering bricks, which came out a little bit too dark because I was experimenting with Vallejo colors, so that's a little bit, little bit too dark. Um, this one, unfortunately, didn't dry in time, so we won't be able to have a look at that right now. But this one did, so we will. So let me just get uh, set up for that. So once your varnish is dry, and you can use acrylic varnish, you can use enamel varnish. There are some caveats with that. With if you use enamel varnish, you can't then use uh, enamel thinner to wipe off excess so in the case of these two buildings i used enamel um just need this i used paint called cement cement rendering because it's a slightly off grayish white and that works very well for the uh, brick uh, brickwork i've diluted that slightly on my palette and just worked it in and initially i wiped it off with just a tissue and then what i did was i took just a dab of enamel thinner and just wiped off just very gently one or two wipes diagonally to the brickwork i wiped it wiped it off and that gets the rest of the remaining enamel wash off uh, the brickwork and that just gives you a nicer, uh, cleaner finish. Right, so we've got that. Uh, let's just do a quick demonstration. Let me just move things around ever so slightly. The paint for the demonstration we're going to be using, it's a Vallejo from uh, the Panzer Races range. It doesn't really matter, but it's like a slightly off-white uh going to gray paint just to uh make it look more like the uh like the cement cement rendering from uh phoenix precision again i'll be doing more color matching on that so hopefully i'll do some uh find the cleanest sort of ish uh sell a dab of it and what i do is i don't use straight water for filling it down uh flow improver makes a huge difference with acrylics i noticed it makes them how to describe that it makes them flow better well as the flow improver it makes them flow better makes them behave much more predictably so what i do is and i'm looking for my yep yeah, there we go i just have an eyedropper which 50 50 water and uh, the flow improver i've seen people use the flow improver neat which you can do i've seen and i've done that as well where it's just i think 10 percent of it or something like that which you can do that as well so a few drops in there about 50 50 
let me find and brushes i don't use anything fancy just a brush cheap plentiful make sure it's all uh, and you want it a uh, sort of milk consistency not particularly well visible but it's uh, see it's it's milk consistency essentially you want pretty much uh we've got to take a bit of that and it's almost goes like a paint but you need to make sure just need to make sure that it all goes into all the mortar lines Let me just double check that you want as little on the surface but as much of it on mortar lines and you have to be quick with this with acrylics and just wipe it off and there's your mortar in all bit in all the uh, mortar lines uh, the last step I do just a second because I forgot to grab them with me I take a wet wet wipe, just a standard wet wipe, and just give it another. It's I left it a little bit too long now. It's still coming off a little bit. You don't want to be too too forceful with that. It will dial it down a little bit. Uh, but the good thing is you can always go over it again. You can keep on going over it as many times as you want to get the desirable effect. Right, so just a second, let me just tidy up. And that's all there is to doing mortar on a laser cut kit. Uh, it's really not that much to it. It's, it's just uh, it's a practice thing and knowing the right technique. You can use both acrylics and enamels for that and uh, yeah, just exper literally experiment, find what you're comfortable with. Uh, you can also do the reverse where you start with paint, start paint the entire model with your uh, mortar color and then dry brush it. But it's not something I have patience for, honestly. Uh, let me just clean that and I'll be back with you in just a second. Right, and then the pot of water it goes tidy up and that's mostly it i think for now uh and the last last thing but we're not going to be covering that uh here is just apply uh, some uh matte varnish either i i'm partial to this stuff because i think it works best however lately i've been uh experimenting with this but what i did i let it settle and i skimmed off the top uh, off of it to make it just more concentrated and more matte. Right, we've got a question from Kelvin. Uh, do you do shiplap tim timber? Uh, not in the range right now, but I can uh, I can I can do some um, as a possibly custom order if you wanted to. Uh, there's a lot of different building materials and things that uh, I'd like to do, but I just didn't get to it yet. Right, so that's that pretty much covers everything. And again, that station just base coat, uh, secondary tertiary color, gloss varnish, mortar, uh, matte varnish, and that's essentially it. Um, one uh, last thing: the roof tiles. What I did with that, I don't have a demonstration for that. That's but that's very very simple. From Phoenix Precision Paints, let me just find it, uh, Roofing Slate. So I gave that a base coat of Roofing Slate. Uh, once that was dry, I didn't bother coating with any varnishes, but I did a wash with uh, black acrylic paint, just a wash, so it goes into all of the uh, gaps and it just gives it a little bit more depth. Once that was dry, I did a dry brush with uh, again with that roofing slate and then I added a little bit of uh, I think green I added just a hint of green just to highlight the edges of the slate and the last thing I did 
Uh, I do actually have my toothbrush, well, very old, knackered toothbrush. Uh, I mixed some of that cement rendering with, it's not going to be very visible here. It's not going to be, but I will explain explain that and we can, you'll be able to see it on, on pictures later on. I mixed a little bit of cement rendering with roofing color, dipped the toothbrush in it and just flicked it on. Because um, slate has like almost like dots throughout it. And I've done one color on that, but you can do however many you want, depending on what you're trying to, uh, trying to recreate. The best thing what I found is study pictures and try to recreate build, try to recreate it just have fun experiment and eventually you will get that it I, I found it frustrating in the beginning but now i've got a bit more experience uh it's become quite easy and uh, i find it it's just very relaxing process uh, i think that's mostly it for now so i think we can move on to questions slowly Thank you, Yakov. <clears throat> Can I just ask if you do damage an edge or you find that some of the layers start to chip off, can you do any sorts of repairs? Yes, there's lots of repairs you can do. If you have the material trying to delaminate, uh, dilute some PVA or wood glue and just make it seep into that part that's sort of delaminating a little bit and just press it together um that way it just you sleep glue into it you press it and then it's it, it it will once it's dry it will go back to you know the uh, same if you for example knock one of those one of those let's give it a knock on the corner you can usually just with your fingers straighten it out so in this case we lost the brick well that's no problem because as long as you've not lost it you can just glue it, well, I've almost lost it, but I still have, still have it. You can just glue it back on and there will be no, basically you won't be able to see that. Um, you won't be able to recover parts if you use too much water. If it's sort of tons, it turns into mush, that's a little bit too late. Uh, but I've had quite a few models that's traveled with me for not 10 years, but probably got getting about five years to shows. And I've repaired damage on them. I cut a part out, or even ripped a part out, because if you not if, if you don't use too much glue, uh, you can actually separate the parts. Um, see. Well, let's see if this separates. <clears throat> there we go. This was glued, but because I didn't use too much glue, it sort of separated. And I can just glue it back together. So you can, for example, do almost like a half uh, half dry run, where you only tack thing tack parts together, and only once you're happy with it, you can add more glue. Right. We've got a question from uh, Ian. Uh, one aspect of laser cutting which I've not seen mentioned previously is one: how small is the beam diameter, and do you have to take this into account when designing a kit, and how do you adjust the output to cut mortar courses, for example? Right, so the beam diameter depends on the laser cutter power. Most of the laser cutters that you'll find uh, for model making, beam is 100 to 300 microns in that sort of range on the lower side it's going to be 100 microns in our case we typically assume about 200 micron beam width and yes you have to absolutely account for that because it's like um cnc milling essentially where you have it, it, it essentially imagine cnc mill but instead of uh, an end cutter you're using a beam of light and there you still have waste material, but instead of the cutter being five mil, it's a two hundred mil, two hundred micron uh, laser beam essentially. So, but you still have to absolutely take that into account and adjust in the project for that. Uh, is that? Uh, yeah, I think that answers that question. Now, uh, the other interesting tidbit with laser cutting is the cut is never perpendicular to the surface so imagine laser 
light is coming in that direction you've got your material the cut is never going to be completely straight it's going to be slightly at an angle and you can see that on the parts not going to be able to see it because it's very uh very subtle on most of the parts but it cuts it's very very this is very exaggerated and this this laser cut is not very well set up then it will do that but it, there's always going to be some degree of of it being at an angle which again you have to be you have to accommodate that for because if you've got parts which join butt up against each other you will find that when you glue it it will want to rest at an angle so you sort of have to prop it up um it's very 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 infrequently that's a problem but it's something you have to think about uh right what about weathering jacob if you want to start adding some moss and things like that what sort of um weathering powders or paints or what do you recommend uh i am not i have to admit i'm not very good at weathering um so for roofs i would usually if i want to add moss i would just dab on take my pva glue or or um or whatever um i would dab on a little bit of pva pva glue and then just sprinkle some uh moss on top of that uh, regarding other weathering you can use uh, dry brush methods so most buildings generally the lower part of it's usually uh, looks damp it's usually darker so you can take and do a dry brush on the uh, parts of the building to give it a little bit more character with the doors uh, you can do a bit of uh, chipping on the bottom with uh, with a brush and a little bit of uh, contrasting paint or whatever whatever they would use for a base paint and just on the bottom of it especially where people would kick it open uh, you could do that uh roofs again uh, moss uh, any other uh, methods you can do more of the sprinkling just to make it a little bit look look a little bit more 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 older i i i i would i would if I was doing anything wedded, I'd most likely try to find some pictures and then just go from that. But again, this is not something I'm I'm an expert on, fortunately. That's really useful. Thank you. If anybody wants to unmute and ask questions, please do. Um, there's a small enough number of us that it shouldn't be too disruptive and it will allow people to ask specific questions if they wish to. Uh, they don't have to be specifically about our kits. I'm happy to answer if there's anything that you need help with from other manufacturers. I'm more than happy to answer the questions because more, more than likely I've, I've some experience with that and I've, I, can, I can help with that. Jack, hello. Hi, it's Ian. Hello. Hello. I don't know if anybody else has, has asked this or mentioned it, or if you touched on it yourself. If you're approached by somebody to do a custom item, I know you know I've already done this, but it's for the benefit of others. How long does it normally take from you know somebody saying to you, "Could you do such and such a um, product or such and such a building?" from that initial approach? through the design stage to the conception to the production of the kit what's your uh, in scale tradition <laughs> right well it can, and i know it's going to be difficult because it depends was, on the prototype and stuff i was going to say it can take between five minutes and five years <laughs> literally no honestly it can i've uh, we don't really do custom work anymore unfortunately yeah. it's just we i have to focus on our own range nowadays yeah but back in the days when we did if it was just a simple window it would take me five minutes to design it five minutes to cut it it would be in an envelope on its way to the customer you know same day i've done uh, station projects where it was good few months of work uh, uh you're probably familiar with uh, uh I, I keep forgetting the name of the layout jackie uh, the oh, mill. Bowaters. yes bow waters yeah. yes. yes yeah the mill I, I don't remember what we but it was again something like 20 30 hours of design 
that went into that into that building. It really depends. Um, I will bring up a uh, station kit which did, we did for somebody else just to demonstrate. And we've done this number of years ago. This is in double luggage, so I do apologize about that. Let's say I don't remember what the prototype is, but this was back in the days we did custom work. And this was again in the 50 to 60 hour range of uh, of working hours. As for how long it took, it was probably a good part of a year. We have a question for Ian from Ian. I understand you produce an interior kit for Signalbox. Do you plan on producing interior kits for any of the other kits such as station? Uh, yes, we are. Absolutely, yes. Uh, but I need to do research. I need to uh, essentially visit Heritage Railways, take pictures, take measurements of everything they have, and then re reference that with some of the pictures of uh, old pictures uh, from stations and uh, other structures and... Uh, yes, we absolutely want to do that, and we will do it. I'll get to that eventually, but yes, the answer is absolutely yes. Um, Kelvin, um, gutters and rainwater downpipes? Uh, I have experimented with that, and I've not had a lot of success with it. However, I found out why. So uh, I've got the projects. I've done them for uh, for somebody else, but it uh, wasn't the greatest to... Of, of products I have to say. I had problems with warping, with 3D printing, because we I 3D printed them in, in resin. With 3D printing, if uh, you can get issues with warping very, very significantly. Um, I have found why the warping occurs when I was working, uh, when I was updating the steel plate bridge in all gauge. So I know why it's happening and I am going to try to do guttering again keeping that in mind and hopefully I'll be able to do it and we can start maybe not even including them in kits but just having them as a side you know side kit uh, something that you can order as an extra or just on its own uh, so yes uh, that is coming and that is in fact going to be tested probably before the end of this year and I just mentioned that there is um, furniture for buildings, architectural furniture, if you want to call it that, available from model use. So they're doing downpipes and hopper buckets and guttering and things now. Um, so, you know, you can get that in different scales as well, depending on the size of your building. Because for the mill building, which Jakob and Derek designed and, and created for us based on pictures of the original mill, we needed to use G-scale guttering and downpipes because it's such a huge building. O-gauge wasn't big enough. So there's lots of things out there, but it's finding the right one that looks authentic. Yeah, and we will be doing, once I get to it, I will actually, I already have some research done anyway, but I'll do more research on different types of them and try to cover it as much as possible. The, the great benefit I have with 3D printing is that if somebody wants something bigger or smaller, I just go in and scale it up or down. And then it just comes out smaller or larger. So that's not that I've done that for quite a few things before. Uh, we've got a question from Alexander. Could you glue MDF parts to polystyrene plastic or sheets? Yes, you can do that. Uh, you need to use contact adhesive, which I think I don't know if that reacts with it, but uh, if I was doing any plastic to MDF or the fiberboard, it's either that, or if it's something small, uh, super glue. I've not tested anything else, uh, but anything that claims to glue plastic and is generally for plastic will, will stick them together. But I tend to default to this. Could you sh show that again and show me the name of that, please? Uh, yeah, no problem at all. It's The name is Bostic. It's uh, just a cheap old, let me just uncrimp this. Uh, it's just literally called contact adhesive. It's probably revert. I don't know if you can see it. Uh, yeah. I I get this from uh, BNM or I think BNM or uh, uh, Home Bargains. I don't remember. I always mix these two up. But it's just contact adhesive. It doesn't have to be Bostic. 
anything that claims to be contact adhesive and what it is, it's that's horribly stringy stuff. It's going to go everywhere now, but it's that's what it is. Um, it's you, you know the uh, it could, n normally you buy it uh, under the brand name Yuhu or something like that, um, but it's just anything and anything that's that sort of type of glue will and it this sticks everything to everything essentially but it's horrible to work with okay thank you very much you're welcome alex has just asked um out of interest of 3d printing he does a bit himself and uses blender as the software for model buildings what sort of software do you use uh, i 99 percent of what i do i do in freecad uh there is those few cases where i finished something in blender uh generally i don't need to uh freecad is uh is is, is typically capable enough to uh produce what i need to if i need to do something uh like the uh armchair we did for the 3d printed uh, interior kit i what i did was and i designed it and did the basic basic shape of that in freecad and then uh, added all the uh, relief buttons and crimps and increases and everything. I added that in Blender. Uh, I am not that great with Blender. I've you can't, but you could actually, in fact, just start with Blender. If you, if you know how to use it very well, which I don't, you could just exclusively use Blender. Do you actually scale your drawing up one-to-one -one, then reduce it at printing stage? No, what I do is I uh, draw draw everything up in in uh, what, what we use Corel Draw nowadays. Um, everything is just done as in in the original size, and then it just gets converted to whatever the machine wants, and it goes to the machine. But it's done if, if it's some, if I want something that's fifty millimeter long, then I set it to fifty mil long, and then it goes into the machine uh, if i'm for example copy not copying but even working from a drawing uh then i would scale it I'll, I'll usually scan the drawing in and then use that as a reference and then build things from that yeah okay but um you have then to know the original scale of your drawing whereas if it's one to one then you just do it at 43.5 etc yeah yeah, so you you so you either need to know the the scale of the drawing, or uh, a lot of the drawings I use have the one to the the actual prototype dimensions on on them right. written down. So I'll scale that down and uh, use that. Or yes, if it, if the drawing hasn't doesn't have any dimensions, but it has a scale, then that's a little bit different. And but, do you use layers so that if you want something to be half cut through it? Um, that's on a different layer to one that's going all the way through. It's a different. Actually, I forgot to answer that question. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, all I do is I just use a different color and then set the power lower. That's right. all it is. Um, it's uh, we, we it, it do, I don't work with layers. It's just uh, say you've got two rectangles. Uh, one will be red, red set as red color, and that will be fully cut through and on the inside you'd have a circle which would be set to half power uh different uh, in in a different color let's say yellow and uh, the laser cutter would just engrave it in rather than cut it all the way through okay well that's es essentially the same as layers then actually because it's the instruction for the color yes. as opposed to the instruction for that layer yeah so actually no you're actually right thinking about that when when i yes we, the, the the software that actually runs the uh, the the cutter it does convert it into colored layers i'm just thinking so i do apologize i'm just thinking colors rather than layers mm -hmm. because that's how when i so when i'm designing anything i don't think layers i think colors and then yeah. when and then what i do is once i can when once i uh, i'm ready to cut it then i uh I, then i do layer it up in the order i wanted to based on colors all right. And what about cutting different materials, like cutting acrylic? We don't cut acrylic. We don't cut plastics because our uh, filtration system is not set up for it. Right. Uh, 
we've done some tests. Uh, I've cut like very small. If I needed a small piece or something, I would cut it out. But the may, but we don't do it as a daily thing because of the fumes. Uh, we're just not set up for that. Okay. just quickly ask about the corner joints um yep. obviously you do get a bit more emphasis like you said of the actual join coming together um do you ever find that you need to fill that at all to actually make it look a bit smoother or are you just adapting that with the heavier paint as you say i just paint over it it's not something that bothers me uh if it's if it's so you can you can use filler on this material absolutely uh and if if if, if you want to you can but what what i would do is uh, you would have to rescribe the uh mortar lines because if you fill it obviously you would fill the mortar lines around it so you just have to rescribe it which is not a terribly difficult job i would assume to do That's Ian just saying apologies. He's had to leave because of phone calls. That's fine. Um, and I, I guess that leads on to my final question. You talked about the fact that um, you have to rescribe potentially. I guess that's what you would have to do if you over painted and you've actually filled the mortar spaces. Yeah. You would need to rescribe them. Yep. Yeah, again, just the same sharp hobby knife you'd use for cutting the material. You can prescribe the lines. Um, on this model, it's not going to be very well visible, but on these upper corners here, I had to scribe some lines because it was they, they were in there essentially uh, because of how I constructed it. But all I did was I just took the knife and just pressed them in. The material conforms a little bit, and that give that gave just about enough of a relief to uh to mortar it up and to to, to make it stand out and look right uh because the material you you probably wouldn't be able to do that with mdf but this material is softer so you can do but you with mdf you'll be able to rescribe with mdf if you fill the uh, the lines yes it's really helpful Ooh. any more questions from anybody While people are just thinking if there's anything else that they want to ask, I'm just going to take the spotlight off of Jakob and just bring up some slides to show you what's coming next month. Um, so first and foremost, thank you very much, Jakob. It's been very, very informative and as somebody who obviously has had some big buildings from you and smaller ones, um, it's been really enlightening, even as somebody who's used them before. And I like that idea of being able to almost do pick and mix and create buildings from different parts of other um, components, if you like. Um, in terms of next month, um, we've got an evening with planned on the 26th of November. That's the last one for this year, um, because obviously we don't have anything on the 26th of December. Um, booking for the November meeting starts tonight at midnight. And next month, we've got Ian Young from... Um, I think it's CSP now, but Sanspari is the other name that you will have heard um, Ian from. And he's actually going to take us through lost wax casting. So that will be very interesting. Some of our manufacturers are very good at telling us what happens behind the scenes in terms of white metal casting or photo etching. And in Ian's case, he's going to take us through the process of lost wax casting. Um, for anybody who um, is interested in doing the online um, shows, we've got our big virtual show on the 4th of November. I think we're up to about 12 layout videos. Some of them are from um, overseas, so there's going to be layouts that you won't have seen before because they're actually in people's homes, gardens, um, and it gives us an opportunity to see layouts that you wouldn't normally see before because they can't come to exhibitions or they're at the other side of the world. 
So if you can join us on the 4th of November, it's free to everybody. You literally come to the website and there will be an obvious screen that will count down from seven days before. Um, and you just literally click on that screen, you enter the show and you get the choice of going to look at the uh, layouts, see demonstrations. Some of the demonstrations are by video. Some of them will be live and you can dip in and out of them. There are lots of traders sending us advertisements and some of them are doing special offers for the weekend. So if you purchase online during the weekend, you can actually get some discounts and live question and answer sessions. So there's something there for all the modelers and it's open for the whole of November as well. So it's live on the day. But anything that is live will be recorded and then you can go and dip in and out through the whole month of November. Um, very popular with our overseas members and members who can't actually get out and about to live shows. Um, we were asked, you know, directly to keep our virtual shows and these evening widths because they're accessible to everybody. Um, the other thing that started recently, and some of you may not be aware of, is our online modelers meetings. Um, these are Zoom meetings again, um, but they're almost a real time extension of the website where actually members just come and chat and talk about what's on their workbench, show each other their layouts talk about any problems they might be having. And so instead of having to ask questions on our forum, people can actually come together from the comfort of their own home in a safe, friendly environment with like-minded individuals and just say, I'm busy trying to do this. Has anybody experience of it? Show people the problems they're having and just help each other and just, you know, chat about what they're modeling at the moment. So to find those, you just literally go to the front page of our website, click on events in the top menu and you get a drop down list and you'll see online modelers meetings and all the Zoom links are there. So you can just literally click through and join. They're all very informal. Um, they're run by members for members. Um, and they were done as a trial and they've been so successful that they're continuing now and there's dates right through to the end of the, of the year. Um, that's where you'll find it. So click on the heading and that's where you'll get the Zoom link. So you can see there in the list of events, there was one on the 28th of September, one on the 12th of October. Obviously, if you go in now, you'll see all the ones for that are coming up between now and the end of the year. So you can just click on those and you'll get the Zoom link and you can just click on the link. <coughs> Uh, next play show, our spring show in Kettering, we're delighted that the Kettering Leisure Village has been saved and the new management are honouring our contract for 2024 and hoping to keep us for 25 onwards. We were waiting for the quotes for that. But make sure the date's in your diary for Saturday the 2nd of March 2024. And then the new flyer with all the dates for next year will be coming out soon. So we've got the 1st of June at Kempton Park and the 7th and 8th of September for Gildex. And as many of you know, we're busy looking for a new venue for a winter show, which will be in the north or northwest area. Um, so we'll keep you posted on all of those developments. So thank you very much to everybody for joining. The meetings don't happen without having an audience. Um, we've got, um, you know, a lot of followers of these meetings and we're pleased that you enjoy them. Don't forget that the clocks will have changed. Um, they would change next week. So we will be in Greenwich Mean Time next week time not British summer time so it's just making sure that you dial in at the right time or click on the zoom link at the right time and as I say the invitations for that will be out from midnight tonight so you can start signing up for next month so I'll just stop sharing those and come back to the main screen are there any final questions for Jakob There is something I actually forgot to cover uh, when painting. I forgot to do the uh, uh, the filler. So if you 
just bear with me for a second. Uh, yeah. We'll cover that. So what this is, just your standard wall filler. A little bit of it on. And I tend to just work it in like that. Make sure it goes into all the lines. Take a tissue. Knock it off. And I take again a wet wipe and just gently. And that's another way to do it. Um, this is a more, I'd say, reliable, and I'm sort of starting to lean towards doing it this way. The only thing, the only caveat with that is that you have to stain it somehow. Um, what you can do after that is just go over it with a very thin, a uh, little bit of a very thin uh, color wash, wash. So that's another way to, to do your mortar lines. So that's, I think, everything from me now. Excellent. Thank you very much, Jakob. Thank you, Jakob. It was very informative and very enjoyable and most interesting. Thank you ever so much for coming. So, as Jackie said, we couldn't do it with an audience, so thank you ever so much. You know, we appreciate the time that you've put into all the preparation and everything as well, Jakob. So, um, and I know that you're going to send some photographs through that we can add on to the actual post-evening um, write-up for everybody. So you'll get names of paints, names of glues, um, and all the things that have been mentioned. Jakob's going to kindly put a list together for us and some photographs. Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Look forward to seeing you next month. Jakob, thank you very, very much, and I'll be in touch soon. Um, and lots of thank yous from people coming up on the screen as well for you. It's been a very, very good evening. I'm glad it was. Thank you very much again for coming. It was absolute pleasure, and uh, I will be updating those the, those lists. I, I just need to do a little bit of color matching, as I said, between uh, Phoenix Precision Paints and uh, Vallejo, so that, uh, as I said, it's just acrylics nowadays are good enough, I'd say, to to uh, very very good, and it's just a health it's just a health aspect of it. So I'll be doing that in the next couple of days. Okay. And there's a comment saying that they're looking forward to your ridge tiles. As well. Yes, <laughs> yes. There will be a big, big, big update because, as I said, I've worked out. I even went as far as I as, as, as far as, as actually working out all the different uh, sizes as well as overlaps. Uh, there's a lot of technical, <laughs> not jargon, but technical uh, vocabulary there. But I've worked it out. I've got a piece of paper somewhere. So it's actually going, when, once it's done, it's going to be done properly. So, yep. Um, John Starling saying that his old ones from Dexter's Cove have bent. So that's why people are looking forward to new ones, I think. Um, and lots of comments about how brilliant tonight's been and an extremely useful presentation. So thank you very much. I think the comments uh, speak volumes, really. Much appreciated. OK, thank you very much, everybody. I'm going to end the evening now and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank, thank you very so much. Down.